Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm so glad you're here. What we're going to do this morning, a little bit different, I want us to, to take the Lord's Supper together, the, the first, well, the first as I'm coming up here and sharing. So good to see you guys. So awesome. Um, so we just want to uh, take a second and think about the Lord's Supper. And, um, and I want to share with you the, the thoughts that I I have about that this morning that, um, you know, sometimes we think about the Lord's Supper for what Christ has done for us and what he, you know, surely he's, he's paid the price for the forgiveness of our sins and redeemed us and brought us to life and, and, um, and we, we're, we're spending this time this morning praising God for that. But I want us to think about he saved us from something, our sin, etc., a broken way of life. But he's also saved us for something. And when we share, the, share communion together, we're not only acknowledging the fact that he has redeemed us and saved us. He paid the price. He brought life into us, etc. But we're also, we're also announcing to the world that we are declaring the coming of the Lord until the, the presence of the Lord until he comes again. We are taking up that mantle and saying, um, I, I will boldly proclaim my love for Jesus wherever I'm at and apply that to every situation that I'm in. And it's my, my beckon to you this morning as we share together um, the, the, the cup and the bread that we would remember that this is a, is, is a sacred consecration that we, we are reminded of the consecration that we have been set aside for. I love the verse in, uh, in Joshua. And, yeah, and by the way, if somebody's needing any communion pieces or um, whatever we call those things. Um, uh, they're good. I think we're good. Okay. Yeah, good, good. Jo Joshua 3, 5, Joshua calls the people of Israel, consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. And so as we share communion together today, let's, let's remember that God is consecrating us he, his Holy Spirit has infused us. He, has, he, he dwells within us, and then he's calling us. As we take the bread and we take the blood, we are announcing our, our belief in that guarantee of that work in his life. So let's, let's take the bread together. Thank you, Jesus. And just allow the, the symbol of the bread to, as you're digesting that, um, that is the body of Christ given for you. Would your spirit just digest this reality? One more time. And Jesus, we thank you for your body that was given for us. Uh, the second you were conceived in the womb of Mary, you humbled yourself, taking on the form of a servant. And we praise you for your whole body being yielded to the Father being willing to be prompted by the Spirit, led by the Spirit in everything you did. 
in, in, in Jesus, we from that, we, we surrender our, and consecrate our bodies to you this morning as well. We call for your holiness to infuse us in every corner um, and maybe this morning even in some places that we have kept, kept closets uh, locked. We pray that you would free us this morning. Father, we ask as now as we take the cup, remembering the blood that was shed for our sins, that we would embrace the fullness, that we would um, bend at your, at your feet to kiss your feet, your, your crucified feet, your, your bloody feet that was sacrificed for us. Jesus, would we embrace your willingness to and the willingness to shed blood that you became sin for us and took the price of that sin upon yourself. And we praise you for that. By the power of Jesus, we say these things. Let us, let's take the, the cup together. I think we, as we get started this morning, and kind of the, the lesson I want to share with you, um, I, I, this word consecration that we thought about as we were sharing the Lord's Supper, um, we want to apply to the things that we want to talk about today, because we're going to, to spend some time talking about the, the sexual brokenness that is abundantly evident within our culture um, today that we all in this room feel the effects of. And there is, a, there is a, you know, as we are continuing in this series on lament, and remember we're, we're talking about lament as being this deep, guttural response to the things that, that aren't the way they should be, that aren't the way that God intended for things to be. And our sexuality across the board has been one of those things that has probably given as much grief to the history of mankind as anything else. And so this morning we want to to take a, a strong look at that. There's, there's no secret that that is an abundant issue that we are having to face in our culture today, that we have to face within the church today, that affects us deeply in, in so many ways. And I, I want us to, to step into this, and we're going to talk fairly, no, n without being graphic, I hope, we're going to be shoot straightforward about the condition of our world. This, this morning we're talking about sexual brokenness, and unless you think we're going to be focused in, on, you know, a bummer, you know, like uh, how awful that is, next Sunday, please come back, as we're talking about sexual healing next, and, and what both individually and for our culture, and how we can bring that about. I want to be sensitive as we talk about these things that some of you in this room today, I don't know, may have been significantly affected by um, sexual sin. Somebody may have imposed upon you as, as a child or as an adult or some other season of your life, uh, crossed a sexual boundary that they... Uh, perpetrated upon you. And I want to be sensitive to that. So I, I'm, again, I, 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 that's probably the first place we need to lament. Because that happens so frequently. And consciously or unconsciously, um, we're all probably on a continuum 
of how we've added to that dynamic in our culture in some way or another. And so we have to, but I want to be sensitive to those of you who might be experiencing that. If you feel like the, the subject matter we're talking about today is like hits too close to home, there's no, you know, just, you know, try to deal with that. Come to me afterwards and let's talk about that. But also let's um, feel free to excuse yourself if you need to do that. We want to respect that um, and have that sensitivity to that. So let's, let's pray before we get any further. Father, this morning we come to you um, with something we know uh, grieves your heart. You lament over the brokenness that has come ab about in our culture because um, of our sexual sin. Um, the history of mankind has been um, tormented by this, this evil. And this morning, God, we, we want to name it, we want to look at it, we want to say what it is, we want to um, announce um, our, um, our complicity in that, but also our desire for your healing in our lives and in our, our nation's life, God, and, and the world at large. Father, we pray. Um, Father, I pray that these words would be used by you, Holy Spirit, to uh, bring um, not just information, but knowledge and that, that changes and transforms the way that we behave and live out our lives. Um, we pray in the power of Jesus. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. So um, let me, let's read a few things together. This, this is a, um, some quotes from Jonathan Grant, who wrote this book, and I, I love the last line of it, uh, talking about the hypersexualized age. Um, that, I think, is a pretty descriptive term of, of the culture that we live in. But he said, <clears throat> the primacy of the individual and the individual's uniqueness shapes our quest for meaning, authority, and identity. So says our culture. The authentic self believes that personal meaning must be found within ourselves or must at least resonate with in, within our one-of-a-kind personality. We must, as we often hear, be true to ourselves. The modern fixation on the individual shapes our sexual ethic in profound ways. Our society generally believes that being true to ourselves especially in our sexual lives, is critical to living a full and happy life. Much of this is taken for granted and goes unquestioned. Our most intimate relationships uh, look, uh, look by each partner as, as a primary source of happiness and self-actualization, measured in, in the narrow terms of personal gratification. Am I getting what I need to get from this relationship? Does it make me happy? Do the benefits to me outweigh the costs? So says our culture. When consensuality and the individual happiness become the primary virtues in sexual expression, human flourishing is stunted Indeed, the modern self sees sexual expression as a virtue that lies at the heart of human identity. We can only be fulfilled, happy, and mature when our sexuality is set free. So says the world. What is needed, and where I hope for us to go this morning, what is needed is an explicit indeed unashamed counter-cultural Christian vision of sexual flourishing, one that does not avoid suffering and sacrifice, but includes it in the narrative, one, uh, uh, one, one that takes seriously the Christian eschatological hope of resurrection and new creation. You probably, when you think about eschatology, don't often think about your sexuality, do you? But in light of in light of 
um, the eschatological hope, the coming of Christ, the presence of Christ in our life, and our hope of a new of a resurrection and the new creation. Um, our sexuality needs to be founded around these things. The life, the death, the teaching, and the eschatological hope of Christ should shape the church's vision for human flourishing, even or maybe especially in our sexual relationships. That's saying, in, in a nutshell, come on, let's, let's be confident and explicit about how the biblical mandate and the biblical directive is for our flourishing and our healthiness and our growth and the beauty of a love relationship. And we need not be ashamed to present that picture to a culture that we live in as we live out that reality in our lives. So we want to back up for a second and look at that model, and we're just going to take a second there's so much the Bible says about this model that, that really is this counter, explicit um, countercultural message that we are trying to present to the, our, our culture. God, I, here's this, this kind of bold statement. Sexuality is God's idea. Is that, are you guys okay with that? Uh, that, 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 is, that is the directive that God has given. It, it's his invention. He created this reality going forward in our, in, for man, mankind, man and woman's flourishing together. So let's go back and let's look at a few of those texts that and we're just going to, again, touch on this. But I want to, here, here's the ideal, and then we're going to come back and look at kind of how we distorted that. Genesis 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. A foundational passage to what the Bible says about marriage and what that is to look like. And he notice, notice there's um, this reflection of the image of God that is in both male and female. There is this, this beautiful picture of seeing the fullness of the image of God in man and woman. And there's this beautiful union that we see best in this human life anyway. One of the best ways that we see the image of God is a husband and a wife in mutual love and affection and intimacy with one another. And I love this. I hadn't thought about this too much, this, this uh, directive to be fruitful and to multiply, etc. We I think we often think about that as, hey, have lots of sex and go have babies, right? Fill the earth, um, that kind of thing. Um, and, in, and that's certainly part of the sexual purpose that we that God intended was uh, that's how procreation happens, a beautiful, uh, creative way that he, he did that. But I wanna, want us to think about, for a second, as we're thinking about this ideal of marriage, to think about it as, think about this as our marriages being fruitful. And we think about our marriages as multiplying and filling the earth. Because this mandate for Adam and Eve was to not just stay in, in, well, really what they were supposed to be doing is expanding the garden. The garden, the Bible defines pretty specifically where originally the garden was at, but God's directing Adam and Eve and thus the rest of us to expand, expand the garden and calling us to be fruitful and multiply. The things you're as reflectors of the image of God, this is, a, this is an ideal that is supposed to be spreading. The, the picture of Eden is supposed to be spreading throughout the world. That Eden, in fact, uh, it was God's hope that it would be uh, spreading and that, that while, while children were being born and, and nations were being raised up, that there would be this spreading of uh, of the fruitful multiplying and filling and subduing pieces of the kingdom of God in their presence. 
That was the ideal. In the second chapter, God continues in, t- in telling the story and, and just ch- jumping around to a couple key verses. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make for him a helper fit for him. Now, that the helper fit for him is a week's, a, a, a summer's worth of s- sermons right there on, on this. There's so much in that, that word that is in that, those two words that are there. That, that speak of this unique relationship between a husband and a wife that, it, that God, was God's intention. Verse 22, and, and the rib, God got Adam into a deep sleep, takes the rib, and, and then it says that the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, from, that, that, let me start over, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, oh my goodness. Woo! This is, this, this is at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, in, in light of this model that was set up around um, being image reflectors of of the will of God of, and, and of the person of God. As we reflect that image, there's this, there is this therefore that comes about, this, this beautiful um, mandate that comes down to all the rest of us throughout time. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And the man and the wife were both naked, and we're not ashamed. Again, this beautiful picture of oneness that a husband and wife, this is God's idea, remember, that a husband and wife share in this level of intimacy with one another and enjoy one another so so deeply, so much so that one plus one still equals one. That, that is, we're going to ta- see in a minute, a profound mystery that the, the math doesn't add up there. It, it is something supernatural that happens where the one flesh, man and uh, husband and wife come together and they are one flesh. There's an intimacy there. Um, even after the fall in chapter three, this, however long that took to get to chapter three, right? But there's even after the fall, it says that Adam knew Eve. There's this intimacy, and there's this, they, they just, you know, didn't do a physical act together. They were knowing one another. There was an intimacy and a concern and a care and a love and a, a, um, all the implications of one flesh to one another. And the man and the wife were both naked and not ashamed. See, that's... And today, there's so much shame around sexuality, even, even within mar- the marriage context. But there, God's original plan was for, for, there not, for this not to be, not to be so, that that, that that should be different, that, that there should not be shame between a husband and a wife. Paul, jumping over to the New Testament, quotes Genesis, as you can see, it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. There's the same thing we just, that nothing's changed. A couple of thousand years later, nothing has changed in God's intention. He says, though, this is a profound mystery. This is, wow, you know, I, a husband and a wife coming together and the spiritual union that that is is a profound mystery. But what I'm really trying to get us to see and why marriage is so sacred is because marriage is this principle. Paul says, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. He's just said in chapter 5, um, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Submit to, submit to her. Lay yourself down for her. Love her as Christ loved the church. Wives, 
Submit to your husbands. Respect them. Die to yourself. Very different from this individualism that we were talking about at the beginning, correct? But, but, but see, one of the reasons why marriage is so sacred and should be held in such honor is the fact that we are in our marriages communicating. It's, it's one of the best gospel expressions that we have of Christ loving the church and displaying his love for people comes about how, in how Robin and I are dedicated to each, one, each other. We look out for one another. We surround one another. We are one flesh with one another. We, it, we be, all, of the, all of the intimacy that, that, that God wants to uncover in us, literally, all of the intimacy, um, mind, body, and spirit, everything, we are proclaiming the coming of Christ into our lives. Isn't that awesome? How much does Christ how much does Christ love the church? Well, let me show you how, by, by how much I love Robin. Now, let me say, I know some of you think, you know, our marriage is pretty stinking perfect. Sorry, honey, um, you're watching this. I, we, it's, it's not. And that's part of, part of our brokenness. Part of our brokenness that we... we share with within our marriage but this is the ideal that god has called us to i love what peter scazzaro um, um, who does a lot of writing around the emotionally healthy church um, and and some emotionally healthy leadership he's, he made this comment this quick comment that that we are to lead out of our marriage spoken to elders and pastors and and that kind of thing I, I would like to, as we've been talking over these weeks about how do we influence our culture, I'd like to suggest that we also influence our culture out of our marriages. When people look at the type of, of intimacy, ideally, that we are to have in, in a, a Christian marriage, would, could, does, that, does, does that example that I'm laying forth there, and, and you guys, I know this is challenging. Boy, we're, we're just going, oh man, we got so much work to do, don't we? Our marriage, we're just kind of, wives, you don't get to do this, right? Um, you know, we, we, are, we, are, we are all broken when it comes to our marriages, and we've got so much to grow in. But I'm, I'm just calling us back to that, that ideal that we are to have about so that, so that our culture is influenced out of our marriages. You guys with me? Good. I'm going to move into some of the places where we've fallen short in that, and the rest of our time will be around that. But I want to say a few things before that, just really quickly. Sexual attraction by itself is not a sin. God programmed us to, you know, see somebody that is attractive to us, and we, well, you know, they're, they're pretty. I'll tell you a story about how I first met Robin. We both went to Bible college together, and uh, this... 21 year old guy so you know picture mark as a 21 year old kind of a ding dong um maybe about the same but anyway um in the admissions office they would put up on the wall all the, the pictures of all the new students coming in and so hmm, i'm gonna go and see what girls are coming into the you know for, you know orientation this next week and so on the wall was the picture of of robin and I was smitten, just her picture. She was beautiful, it was a beautiful picture, but there was also, as you, you know, some of you know Robin really well, this depth, to, I mean depth just poured out of that picture. And I said, hmm, she's attractive to me. Uh, um, that was not a sin. That, that's how we were made. Fact. It was a fact. It happened. You know, bang. You know, it was there. That, so we, we want to focus on that. I love that story. 
and 44 years later, she still kind of drives me crazy. Um, secondly, we're all sexually broken. As we look about how, how do we, how do we um, help our culture to become healed of, of this kind of oppressive thing in our lives, we have to recognize we're all, we're all sexually broken. And that, that's on a continuum somewhere of how that, that shows up. But we have to keep, make sure we're taking that log out of our eyes as we're looking at some of these things. Some of the things we're going to talk about this morning, you are going to be convicted about or you're going to be reconvicted about. We, um, but there's no place for shame in, those, in this discussion. Shame is a crippler. Shame is the thing that keeps our, our sexual sins hidden. Uh, we don't want anybody to know that we struggle with X, Y, and Z, especially, unfortunately, especially within the church. And so we keep things hidden, and we don't talk about these things so that we can find healing within the fellowship that we're a part of. The next thing I want us to remember if, is that if, if we are, are convicted about some of our, the things in our lives, we need to remember the compassion of the Father. The Father is not... You know, when, when, the, when the son went off and lived a riotous life, which un, doesn't say so, but undoubtedly it c included a lot of womanizing, bar hopping, who can I pick up at the bar, the, whatever the, the local bar was in whatever town he was in, he was sowing his oats. Yeah, the prodigal, yeah. And so... And so there is this, but you know the story. The father's looking out the window and he runs back to the son before he even hears one word of repentance. The father is running after the son. And that's how he sees us this morning. And then um, what's, so if, if I've sinned over here sexually or in other ways, what's the truest thing about me? Is it my sin or is that that sin has been covered and washed by the, the blood of Christ? That is what the truest thing is about me. And finally, as we talk about these things, can Clear Creek become a culture, can be, become a place where people can come and find healing in their sexuality and in their brokenness in this regard? Those are some things I, I want to say ahead of time. But... We also have to say clearly and directly these couple of things. Any sexual behavior outside of marriage is not within the, ten, the intentions and purposes of God and is therefore sin. It's sin. Let's be clear about that. Now, Again, another place of brokenness. Maybe many of us have already violated that and we're aware of that, but that's, that's still the standard. Just like the high calling of marriage is the standard, the, the reality of sexual sin has to be stated and will be stated from this pulpit. Paul says, but among you there must not be even a hint, a sliver, a molecule of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, which is, remember at the beginning, individuality? We, sometimes we think, well, what's greed doing there in the middle of sexual sin? But that's greed in, in selfishness in our sexuality is what is the first thing that gets us in trouble because I want to be satisfied in it. Th these things have to be there because um, these are improper for God's holy, sanctified, justified, consecrated people. They're, 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 you guys, if, if, we're, if there's a question... If there's a question in, in, in our mind, should I be watching this television show right now? That's probably a hint. 
you have to be mindful of that hint. So therein is, is the standard that I, that I present to you as the, the biblical standard um, of, of the, the boundaries that we have to be careful of. So all of that said, here's some things. Remember, we're in this series on lament. Here's some things I personally, I think you'll join me, that I grieve about. Number one, I grieve and I, I lament over our generation's redefinition and rejection of God's beautiful, healthy, pleasurable, and gospel-announcing intention for intimate human relation, relationships and sexuality in marriage. And related to that, I am grieved over the fact of our, of our culture's progressive bondage to the unfulfilled promises of on-demand sexual distortion. Our culture is bombarded with, with a, a, a rejection. Oh, oh, that's, boy, that's old-fashioned. Um, Mark, you don't mess around. I, I've, I've had, I don't know how many times my guys at McLaren have asked me, you know, oh, Mark, I bet you partied this weekend, right? You know, that, that's unheard of. But there's a bondage, that, and so many of those guys and so many of us have fallen into the bondage of, of the unfulfilled promises of sexual distortion. The second thing that I grieve over is the idol, idolization of marriage and limited definition of family. And now, I just elevated marriage a second ago. What do I mean by the idolization of marriage? Number one, um, I, I come back to the, the, the thing that I grieve about there is that a few of us keep in mind the, the high calling of, of what marriage is supposed to be about. We think it's about us. We think it's about our personal satisfaction, and, and really it's about the glorification of Christ. We don't live there. I think I can say that for us as Christian people. We don't live in that place. The second thing about that is we have this, this lie in our minds is if I'm with somebody, even in dating, you know, when you're a teenager or a young adult and you're dating somebody, if I'm with somebody, I'll be happy. That somebody else is going to always make me happy. And that's a lie. Another individual on this earth cannot make us happy, even if you're married, even if you had the greatest wedding ever, you had the greatest celebration ever, greatest honeymoon ever, on um, some point the honeymoon is over and you wake up, uh, Robin woke up to me, <laughs> okay? Um, there, there are some ugly things about Mark Pollock. If you had to live with me, you would you know, be in a Robin Pollock support group. Uh, right, right away, you would just be in that place. So we can't allow marriage to be the only the thing that identifies us because we do that with uh, our career and our education and our money and all of those things. If, if we have all of those things, somehow we Christians buy the lie that, that I'm somebody if I have these things. Not so. Finally, we, and not finally, but next we have, you know, we have no little place and little um, embracing of singleness and even celibacy. Some people have chosen to remain celibate and just dedicate their lives to the Lord. And maybe that's a result of not finding a marriage partner or whatever, but there's, <clears throat> excuse me, many people, and some, some people choose to remain unmarried because they know what their sexual temptations are, and it's not consistent with, with biblical marriage. And so they choose to remain celibate. And that, that is a thing that should be honored and respected. And, and we create a place, that last, that last point there, is that we, the church fellowship creates this broader definition of family. How about if on our next holiday that we have, we um, look for um, the 22-year-old single person who doesn't, whose family is a long way away, and we invite them into our celebrations. 
How about if we, you know, invite the, the, the 85-year-old person that's living alone into our celebrations? Not just church activities, but hey, you know, I want you to come to my son's graduation, his eighth grade graduation. He loves you so much. He remembers when you taught him in Sunday school. We just want to share this moment with you. The Christian family, there's another ideal that we live short of. And ultimately, we lose our identity, and we find it in so many other things other than Jesus. I mean, there's a lot of things that identify us as people, but as Christians, Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of our personal identities. And as long as, ultimately, as long as Jesus loves me, this I know. I can be poor, I can be single, I can be, um, I can have sinned, but that doesn't change um, his love for me. The third thing that I want to lament over. In the midst of this ideal, in the midst of the strong biblical teaching that we have in the, in the evangelical church, why is there no difference between the divorce rate of Christians and the secular society? Do you have an answer for that? <laughs> okay. Um, when we become Christians, we come with a lot of baggage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's, there's baggage. And so we, and with that baggage as Christians, we all have baggage, and, we, and this, this is a safe place. We want this to be a safe place for all of our baggage. There's plenty of room in the overhead, right? There's, we've, we've come with baggage, but I would suggest too, and, and so let's, let's not hide that baggage. Let's put that baggage out there and say, this is, this is stuff that I want to sanctify. I want to consecrate this baggage and let Jesus grab hold of that. But we can't do that in secret. So that's, that's the thing. But I, I think that we've, we've unfortunately, we're, we're just not mature enough when it comes to our understanding of Christian marriage as a whole. I mean, that, that number should be significantly different. If we are people who say we have the, the Holy Spirit embodied in our person and in our fellowship, that number should be significantly different. Come on. I grieve over the fact that 54% of evangelicals believe that it's acceptable to live together, to cohabitate prior to marriage. And friends with benefits, sexual benefits that come with that, that casual sex is acceptable. What has happened, and, and these, numbers, these numbers aren't significantly different, especially the divorce thing has not been different in my lifetime. Uh, maybe the living together thing has changed in my lifetime. But currently, that's unacceptable. Well, I think four contributes to three. And four contributes to three. Yeah, exactly. Um, why is it that 60% of Christian men are viewing pornography on a regular basis? And... And 30, you know, the, the numbers for, you know, this is supposed to be a guy's sin problem. The numbers for, for women are increasing. And, the, and for, for women, young women between the ages of 18 and 30, it's one third of the women in that age bracket are regularly viewing pornography. Um, one, because of the internet, because it's so available, so prominent. But this is a huge. Uh, I think it's a, both a mental health and a physical health epidemic <laughs> that honestly makes COVID look like, you know, a sneeze. The effect of this, and, and in fact, the addiction to pornography is called the new cocaine. The same amount of dopamine that is kicked off in your brain when you use cocaine is the same amount of dopamine 
that is kicked off when you regularly are viewing pornography. The pleasure center of your brain is on, literally on crack. Okay? And it's a progressive disease. Just like with alcohol, you drink a certain amount, you get to a place where um, you have... Um, you, you, the, the same amount of alcohol doesn't do the same trick, and so you have to drink more to get the same buzz. It's the same with, with pornography. You might start off with a you know, Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition, and you're progressively moving up to more objectifying, demeaning, <laughs> violent, aggressive, hurtful sexuality. And notice that there is a huge correlation with this epidemic, with divorce, domestic violence, and, chi and child sexual abuse. Come on. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink, listen, the maddening wine of her adulteries. To drink the passion of her sexual immorality. I'm not here to tell you how to interpret the book of Revelation this morning, um, but looking at this, this is the amount of pornography that is produced in the world, around the world. And I think you can see where the nearly two-thirds of it is produced. And, and the second closest to that is in liberal the Netherlands. Now, and it's not even, not even half the amount, or it's less than half the amount. It's our country that is producing, producing the maddening wine. God, we are so sorry. We pray for our nation to be healed of this. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. The modern push for expressive individualism in sexual relationships be who you are, uh, just don't hurt any, anyone else, has fueled the pornification of the Western world. Those who become addicted to risk-free sex face the ultimate risk, the loss of love. We think love in our culture, we think love is equivalent to sexuality. And Jesus has come along and said, hmm, no. Uh, that's such a descriptive, the pornification. That's and such a descriptive thing that has happened to our, our, our culture. Following off the, the very next thing that I grieve about is sex trafficking, because we, if you don't know this, sex trafficking is fueled by pornography. It is paid for through pornography. Even, even if you enter, go on to a site that does not, you don't have to pay anything for on the internet, you are, you're, you are still fueling, you are still moving money toward that product, product. And those things that you are seeing, almost all of the pornography that you see in, in and I hope you don't see, on the internet is comes from sex trafficking. 
Jesus. Keep that in mind the next time you're tempted to go to a page you, don't, you shouldn't go to. And can we never let the, can we always let this picture speak to us? In the name of Jesus, we ask God. Worldwide, there are nearly two million children in a commercial sex trade. There are an estimated 600,000 to 800,000 children, women, and men trafficked across international borders annually. And this is talking about the broader term of human trafficking, which where, wherein people are kidnapped to basically be slaves in other parts of the world. So 600,000 to 800,000 a year, over a decade, that is six to eight million children women, and men. That'll sober us, I hope. Approximately 80% of human trafficking, victims, human trafficking victims are women and girls, and up to 50% are minors. The total market value of illicit human trafficking is estimated to be in excess of $32 billion. I want to I go to this topic next. But we're not going to have time to really give it justice this morning because I, I think I've said a lot. And I think I want to, I think I just want us to spend some time in prayer. I, I, I'm speaking next week on the sexual healing, so maybe I'll pick up on kind of the gay, lesbian, transgender question, which is maybe needs, you know, well. And let me, let me say this about that. Um, the elders and I the other elders and I are um, looking at some materials right now that I think present a very compassionate, um, orthodox view of um, the whole LGBTQ question and and issues that are out there. That we're going to be we're going to try to be educating ourselves a little bit more fully about. Um, I'll present a few things next week and how we can respond to that and understand that that growing issue in our, in our culture and in our church. Um, but I think for the sake of, of time today, I would, you know, pray for us about that because that's, that's an ongoing, um, you know, hitting right at home kind of where we live issue for uh, how we respond in the church uh, to that issue. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chop that off right now, but I just sense that we, we need to spend some time praying about the things I've already discussed. Is that okay with you guys? Um, again, first of all, I just ask, um, Father, if this, if the things, these heavy heavy things that I believe need to be talked about um, have, um, uh, first of all, I pray that they would, they would have an impact upon um, the alarm that should be going off in our heads and our minds around um, how we respond to um, this as a church and as your people and the holiness that should be brought to um, to this kind of thing. So, God, I pray for um, for all of these issues and more that we will 
continue on next week. But I pray, God, that you would um, empower us to be people of, of healing and compassion, along with truth. But, but God, I, I think we are we're safe around the truth thing. We don't live that out all the time. But help us to be people of compassion when it comes to people who are broken sexually. I'm, I want to just ask if, you know, around some of these issues we've talked about this morning, if somebody wants to, to, pray, to lead out and my leg's asleep. Uh, I might need some help getting down off the <laughs> steps today. Darren, I'm there. For, you're there for me, aren't you? Okay, I might do a belly flop in your face. Um, but so would somebody just t pick, it, pick an issue if you're, if you're led to do so and just, just lead out in, in prayer around some of these things that we want to have the, the heart of God. Remember, that's, that's our thing with lament. What's the heart of God? How does God see these things? Yes, God. We know each and every one of the cultures and struggles that do happen in marriage. Father, I pray that you would help each of us. Yes. sexuality as a way for mankind to express the oneness that you exist in all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I pray, Lord, that you will help guide us to find our way back on track because it is clear that man has allowed his sexual appetite to uh, distort derail uh, his life and his sexuality and his relationship. Thank you. So dear Father God, we see that statement that we're buying and working in our country. In our world, it has fed lies and deceit that the parental breed and Lord we just how to be selfless and we don't know how to uh, focus on you more than ourselves and that's really evident uh, in the church and in our marriages and in the way that we idolize marriage and the way that uh, we treat each other in our relationships and so I repent on behalf of the church and on behalf of our country uh, for all the ways that we harm each other mm -hmm. in what's supposed to be an intimate, trusting relationship. And God, I, I pray that 
we can wake up our church to take our eyes off of uh, idolization of marriage and put it on to you and um, that you would renew all of our relationships and help us to embrace the, the orphan and the widow and people who don't have relationships naturally, help us to embrace the barren. Hmm. And I pray that we can um, really come to terms with our true purpose in life. And it's not to be fruitful and multiply. It's not meaning just to just, just to have a family, but it means to embrace the broken and the lost and to create a family that is you and that's in you. And God, I repent on behalf of our nation for all the trafficking that we contribute to hmm. through pornography and in all the other ways so much of it takes place here in Portland. Hmm. Um, so I pray that you would help us to be aware and to take care of each other and um, look out for the safety of children and of the vulnerable. I pray that we don't let shame and stigma keep us from protecting each other and from fighting on behalf of the oppressed. Father, I pray this morning that you would um, bring healing to my brothers and sisters and what, wherever they fall on that spectrum of, of brokenness, would you, um, would you please bring healing to their, um, their spirits this morning? Maybe even this subject has, has triggered some, some painful thoughts, so... Um, we ask that you would meet them where they are at this morning and bring um, wholeness and healing um, that we we believe you're able to do lord this is um, sometimes we we doubt and you know we say i believe help us help me in my unbelief and that for some of for some of us the 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 tor torments of um sexual sin committed or sexual sin inflicted um, is our huge um, boulders that are, are wrapped around us sometimes. So we pray that you would break every chain this morning, that you would bring um, absolute healing to my brothers and sisters and the places that they hurt and, and even if it's a non-sexual thing, God, would you bring healing to their beautiful spirits this morning? I pray that you would do this work. Father, as we continue this discussion, um, could we be thinking about things this week? How do you want us to influence our culture, God? Would you teach us and mold us in, in the ways that you call us to, I pray in the power of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I did it, Darren. As we conclude for the day, um, thank you, Mark, for a great sermon and challenging. Uh, we wanted to share some announcements, so it's going to be a little bit on the lighter side as we get ready to transition.